At least 592 deaths. Just yesterday, American deaths topped 100 in a single day for the first time. With me now to begin this hour here at the White House, the Vice President Mike Pence, who is leading the task force from Washington. And thank you for your time today. Good to see you, Bill. Welcome to the White House. Thank you. It's an honor to be here. And I hope for the people at home, they get some value over the next two hours. We'll try and get them some answers. Moments ago, New York's Governor Andrew Cuomo is imploring the construction immediately of up to 30,000 ventilators to be shipped to New York. What would be the holdup on that, sir? Well, let me say first and foremost that um, as the president announced action earlier this week for New York, uh, for Washington State, for California, that from very early in this process, President Trump has forged uh, a seamless partnership with our governors. The way that we respond uh, to health crises in this country is, as, as FEMA's mission describes, it's locally executed. The health care workers and at times law enforcement on the ground, community officials that are in the lead. It's state managed, Bill, and then it's federally supported. And from early on, we've been working that formula, empowering our governors, making sure they have the resources and the support that they need. And it's one of the reasons why we've been we've, we've been surging resources. The president uh, uh, announced that at the Javits Center in, in, in New York, uh, that we're helping to build out about 1,000 beds at a field hospital. The president approved a major disaster declaration. And we're working around the clock on making sure that they have the masks, the medical supplies, and the ventilators to meet that need. Now, you and the president have said consistently that many American companies have come to you offering the resources that you need. Yet FEMA today says it will um, make a request for test kits starting today, and it will use the, the DPA, the Defense Production Act. How close are you to employing that for, let's say, the ventilator request from New York State? Well, first, let me, let me just say, if the American people could see what I've seen, both in this president's leadership and in the response of American businesses, they would be inspired every day. Uh, the president did initiate the Defense Production Act. That allows a president of the United States to mandate production of particular items at times of war or national crisis. The reality is, though, that whether it be masks, that Tens of millions are being produced with spun-up production of companies like 3M and Honeywell. And even Haynes has stepped forward to manufacture masks. Uh, or whether it be ventilators uh, and equipment that our hospital personnel need. What the president and I have witnessed consistently is that every time we've asked American industry to step forward, they've said yes. No one has said no yet. And, and we are working now through the structure of FEMA through managing the supply uh, chain at FEMA uh, to make sure that we're harnessing the full energy of the American government, just as we're harnessing a whole of government approach at the federal, state, and local level to confront the coronavirus. So what we have done starting last night is we've reached out to our viewers all over America, asking them to file questions with us. Sure. And many of these questions come by, uh, by way of video. So I want to get to those right now, and I, I know in this interactive sense, we want to try and bring the American people to the White House and vice versa. That, that's why we're here today. But let me, let me respond on the ventilator issue, just to be very clear. The, the national stockpile, as we indicated, has some 20,000 ventilators, and we've been making those available to states. Particularly, we have been focusing resources, ventilators and mask and gowns, on the states most impacted. Those would be Seattle, where the major first outbreak occurred, California, and we have really been focused on the epicenter of the coronavirus a threat in this country, uh, in the state of New York and the greater New York City area, including mm -hmm. New Jersey. We'll continue to prioritize those resources, but the American people should understand and be encouraged to know that when it comes to ventilators, which are those devices, when, when people reach a point with the coronavirus where they have severe respiratory struggles, that there are, by most accounts, more than 150,000 respirators in, in hospitals and clinics across the country today. It's not merely what's in the national stockpile bill. But also, because the president of equipment that they use for outpatient surgery, for administering anesthetics for anyone that's ever been put under, and working quickly with the FDA, we were able to inform governors that those devices 
can be quickly converted to respirators for coronavirus. Uh, people struggle their manufacturing line to create mm -hmm. ventilators. And we're seeing industry step up, and I want the American people to know that uh, that because of our cooperation uh, with medical professionals around the country, we're identifying all new resources, all new equipment that can be converted, that can add uh, to the supply of tens of thousands of ventilators. Okay. And we'll continue to meet this we moment can... with creativity and with the resources of the American people. I just people. want to give our viewers at home an opportunity to get in on this, and I Please. appreciate the answer on that. We'll come back to that a bit yeah. later here today. Carlia from Merritt Island, Florida, has the first question. Here is Carlia on that. I think a lot of us right now are just wondering, what is the potential for a national stay-at-home order? Is this something that America could be seeing in our near future? A national stay-at-home order. How much have you considered that? Carlia, I can tell you that uh, at, at no point has the White House Coronavirus Task Force discussed what some people call uh, a nationwide lockdown, uh, or as you described, as a, a stay-at-home order. Uh, what we've done is publish uh, the president's coronavirus guidelines. I've got them right here, and I recommend them to everybody's attention. It's the 15 days to slow the spread. This is what we believe every American should be doing during what uh, remains of the next week or so, uh, because we think we have the chance to significantly reduce the spread of the coronavirus and the threat that it presents to the most vulnerable among us. You know, it's important to remember that, that most Americans, even those that contract the coronavirus, will fully recover. Um, but for those who are seniors with a serious underlying health condition or anyone with an immunodeficiency, the coronavirus represents a serious threat to their health. If and I so the just president interject. is calling on every American yeah. to uh, avoid groups of more than 10, to not eat in restaurants, use drive throughs avoid discretionary travel. We believe this can significantly reduce the spread of the coronavirus. But that being said, let me say, as, other, as states like California and uh, Illinois and, of course, New York uh, and elsewhere have taken strong measures, President Trump and I and our team fully support the decisions by your state and local officials that may be stronger than this. But we believe this is the right prescription across the board to slow the spread, uh, and, uh, and, and we recommend it to every single American. On that chart are 15 days. Right now, we're round day nine, so we next are. Monday is officially the 15-day mark. I'm mm -hmm. going to bring in my colleague, Harris Faulkner, who is with us as well. And Harris, hello again. Well, hello, Bill, and good to see you, Mr. Vice President. Uh, I Thank just you, have kind of an opening question, and then absolutely, and then I'll get to another viewer question, because the, the power of the people, their voice is so important today. I, I want to follow up, though, on this ventilator hospital surge type of support sure. for particularly the three hardest hit states, Washington, California, and New York. And hearing from Governor Cuomo, as we have, and he is want to update the nation every day, um, about the talk. As you say, the administration's not saying no. He's saying that the administration is saying no about that stockpile of ventilators. Those are needed, as you said, Mr. Vice President, when this thing kicks in and it attacks your lungs and it becomes pneumonic. Yeah. It, is, it is powerful stuff, and we need to gear up. So if the spike now is doubling the number of cases in New York every three days, which is what Governor Cuomo said, and mm -hmm. we're almost at what we thought would be an apex, and we're not there yet, he calls it a bad combination of how many cases and people who are actually getting sick and how woefully uh, ill-prepared we are in the numbers of ventilators. Why not just release that stockpile now? Well, what I can tell you and, and, your, and your viewers, uh, uh, Harris, is that uh, we're doing just that. Uh, we're in the process. Uh, of, of literally sending the entire national stockpile out. And I want the people of New York to know that uh, we are putting a priority on the state of New York and, of course, on Washington and California, where the outbreak has been the most severe. You know, since the president uh, uh, signed... All right. Uh, 
We'll continue to detail that, but uh, I, I can promise you in our conversations with, with uh, Governor Cuomo, in our conversation the president and I had with Mayor de Blasio just uh, day before yesterday, uh, we want to assure them that we're going to make those resources available. We're going to identify resources that are in the private marketplace, but we are calling on our governors to identify those uh, respirators in their outpatient clinics that anesthesiologists mm -hmm. and now the FDA have said can be converted. This literally, Harris, would add tens of thousands of respirators to our health care facilities. And we renewed that call to our governors and we will continue to share that message, even while we increase production. Well, well, and, and you know, what people may be able to appreciate about what you're saying, Mr. Vice President, is perhaps that could be done expeditiously because they're already in the system. I'm just trying to find out on people's behalf what's faster, releasing the stockpile uh, and putting more. And I don't live in New York. I'm just looking across the river and knowing that the Javits Center, uh, which is across from the ferry and a lot of transportation hubs, right. is being turned into a makeshift hospital. So the visuals on this thing are eye-popping. What's faster, going through the system as you're describing or the stockpile? Just real quick answer on that, and I'm going to get to a viewer. Harris, we think uh, the president says it's an all of the above strategy. We want to use the national stockpile. We want to identify resources that are already in the marketplace, including what the FDA has now approved to be converted to be used as respirators. But we are spinning up industry every single day. And the president's made it clear he's fully prepared to use the Defense Production Act. The executive order he signed against, against hoarding and price gouging yesterday was based on the Defense Production Act. But at this point, I, I can tell you, uh, American industry is stepping forward as never before. And, and we're going to meet this challenge as Americans together. All right. Uh, real quickly, can we go to that viewer question from Corey B? What can we start to look for as the new normal? What can we start to expect as far as long-term lasting changes to better prepare us for the next health crisis or pandemic facing our country? All well, right, Mr. A, Vice President, please go right ahead. Well, it's, it's a great question. And, uh, you know, the president reflected on the fact that there, there may be some, some really good changes in practices just in our culture going forward as we've dealt with this un, unprecedented uh, spread of the coronavirus and an infectious disease. Uh, but uh, what we're working toward in this 15 days is to literally lower the number of Americans that will be exposed to the coronavirus. I'm inspired to see literally reports of people all across this country, not just in areas that have seen an outbreak, but in areas where there have been a limited number of cases. They're putting into practice these principles, and, and we have every confidence, our health care experts do, that that is slowing the spread. But make no mistake about it, the president, as he said yesterday, is has asked the task force, our health experts, our entire team, to bring him recommendations about what's next. And the president made it clear mm -hmm. that while we stay completely focused on the most vulnerable, uh, on people for whom the, the consequences of contracting the coronavirus could be quite dire, which is seniors with serious underlying health conditions and people with immunodeficiencies, uh, the president said we, we want to find a way, as, as he said, to, to open America back up, to get American business moving again. Uh, the president's asked our team for recommendations about not how we do one or the other, but how we do both. Mm -hmm. And over the months ahead, we'll focus on our most vulnerable, but putting America back to work will also be a priority, as the president said, uh, in weeks and not months. All right. Harris, thank you. I know that you. Georgetown, Texas, and Corey B. are excited to hear about the future. Bill, back to you. You know, Harris, I think Corey's question really, it, it, he puts his finger on what everybody is concerned about. So thank you for the question, and thank you for being here. Our coverage continues in a moment. We're live at the Rose Garden here at the White House for the next hour and 40 minutes. In moments, President Trump will join our conversation, our virtual town hall, as well as other members from the task force. And we will continue to take your questions on the pandemic. All of that is straight ahead here on Fox News.
from now, President Trump will join our virtual town hall, so he'll be up here in minutes, and a couple members of his task force will be here. Dr. Deborah Birx will join us, the Surgeon General. So we will get their input as to where we are now, what the Vice President was describing a moment ago, this 15-day slow-the-spread plan uh, that started really about nine days ago. So we're well into that now. We'll get a sense as to, uh, from the experts, what they are feeling and what they are hearing, and based on the data numbers, not just here at home, but around the world. In the meantime, Chief White House Correspondent John Roberts, live here from the North Lawn, other side of the house here, so to speak. John, good afternoon to you. Bill, we could almost hear you from the uh, White House driveway here. You know, what, what, one of the big topics of conversation here, and we saw that last hour with Governor Andrew Cuomo of New York, and we saw it with the president yesterday, and I'm sure you'll talk about it today. The vice president mentioned it, is how do you start to reopen parts of the American economy? You've got two tracks here. You've got the health part of this in the White House. And many of the states believe they're making good progress on that in terms of ramping up testing, getting medical supplies in the pipeline, though there are still shortages. But then there's the economic track as well. And even with the coming fiscal stimulus package that we expect from Congress soon, how long can you keep large sectors of the American economy closed down before the whole thing starts to crater, which is why on the state level and the federal level, officials are now looking at a plan where they could reopen sectors of the economy and get people back to work. Here's what the president said about it at the coronavirus briefing last evening. We cannot let the cure be worse than the problem itself. We're not going to let the cure be worse than the problem. At the end of the 15-day period, we'll make a decision as to which way we want to go, where we want to go, the timing. And essentially, we're referring to the timing of the opening, essentially the opening of our country. Now, the president has gotten a lot of criticism. Well, how can you send people back to work when they're just going to help spread the virus? The president saying, and, and Governor Cuomo echoing that today, that we have learned about transmission and which populations are vulnerable. And if you can isolate vulnerable pop populations, then perhaps you can let younger people go back to work. Clearly, the medical community and the president's medical advisors will play a big role in this. When asked about it and what guidance he would get from the medical community and his advisors and whether he would take it, this is what the president said. If it were up to the doctors, they may say, let's keep it shut down. Let's shut down the entire world. Because again, you're up to almost 150 countries. So let's shut down the entire world. And when we shut it down, that'd be wonderful. And let's keep it shut for a couple of years. You know, you can't do that. And you can't do that with a country, especially the number one economy anywhere in the world. You know, one of the things that is going to be key, Bill, into whether or not this this can actually happen is the development of what are called serology tests. The current test that we have for coronavirus right now tells you if you have an active infection, but it doesn't tell you if you used to be infected. They're hoping to develop very soon a, a pinprick blood test. And Dr. Deborah Burks was talking about this yesterday. They would tell if you have antibodies to a previous coronavirus disease that you have recovered from. And there's an idea that if you get a widespread serology test, people can get tested to see if they did have the virus. And if they did, they recovered, they're no longer infected. Those are the first people that could potentially go back to work. We'll see how this all goes. A lot to talk about with the president coming up. Yeah, no? Dr. Burks may help answer that as well. They talked yesterday about this swab, self-test. John, thank you for that. Back with the vice president here. It's specifically about the economy and this whole idea about the cure, not making sure that it's not worse than the problem itself. Mm -hmm. um, if day 15 is Monday and the president's clearly sent a signal that he's going to reevaluate this stuff, my guess is you're evaluating it on an hourly basis, clearly on a daily basis. But what would be the trigger mechanism to tell certain parts of the country it's okay now? You've got the green light. Well, let's begin with the fact that the, the 15 days to slow the spread was a recommendation that the president embraced that we believed in uh, that when you think about this curve of the epidemic, that we were at the early point in the curve, and that if Americans were willing to step up and, and, and embrace these practices, that we could literally, we could lessen the impact of the coronavirus and ultimately save lives. The great news is millions of Americans are doing this, and what the president tasked our team to do uh, at the White House Coronavirus Task Force and with, with our top health experts is now to evaluate the progress that we have made and bring the president uh, recommendations uh, for how we could begin to open America mm -hmm. up in the weeks ahead. But the most important thing for your viewers is to understand, as people are wondering, what can I do, what difference can I make, is literally by uh, avoid, you know, avoiding groups of more than 10, not eating in bars and restaurants, 
right now, uh, avoiding unnecessary travel. And these are all the kind of practices that will prevent the inadvertent spread and, and, and ultimately lower the, the amount of Americans that will be exposed to this, which puts at risk that, that group of people that are, are truly vulnerable to serious consequences. Um, it, you know, the, the truth is the, the risk to the average American from the coronavirus, the risk of serious illness remains low. But uh, because it's three times more contagious than the flu, and because as we study numbers from what we know of China, study numbers from South Korea, Italy, and Europe, uh, it, is, it is particularly seniors, seniors with serious underlying health conditions that we've got to be particularly careful about. And that's why the 15 days to slow the spread was put into effect. But as the president looks forward now, he, as he said, he's looking for recommendations about how we can responsibly reopen America while taking care of our most vulnerable. Interesting. You said weeks, too. We can come back to that also. But in the meantime, uh, Harris has one of our excellent viewer questions. Back to Harris for that now. It, it is so true. And they have their pulse on the economy right now. Mr. Vice President, you're right on time with that. Let's watch George from Los Angeles, who submitted a question. Uh, and then we'll get to it. This was on Facebook. We employ eight people who have been loyal. We have promised to take care of them for another 15 to 30 days. Beyond that, it's going to be very difficult for us to survive. What are you prepared to do for small businesses like ours? Mr. Vice President. Well, thank you, George, for the question. And, and, and let me say that right after seeing to the health uh, and safety of the American public. Uh, this president has been working from early on uh, to make sure that uh, the American people have access uh, to free coronavirus testing. Uh, we've worked with insurance companies. We work with the Congress to provide support. And right now, the Congress is negotiating uh, a bill that would provide direct support to American families. The average family of four would receive a payment of $3,000. But speaking about those great employees that I can tell you really love and cherish like any small business owner does, Congress also has a provision that would provide direct payroll support to companies like yours to keep people on the payroll even if the business is closed for a period of the next mm. few months. It's, it is an, an effort for us to make the resources available so businesses across the country can weather the storm. We're gonna, we're gonna also have facilities, lending facilities that make it possible for our vital industries like, like hotels and airlines, and we've talked to our cruise industries. Mm -hmm. Those that have been so impacted have access to capital but for small businesses, companies with less than 500 employees, there'll be that payroll support, which, uh, which is all designed to make sure that we can weather the storm. And Congress is working on it right now. I think the president uh, said again last night that we remain uh, hopeful that Congress will come together, maybe yeah. even before the end of the day, to pass the CARE Act. But it's absolutely essential for our workers, for businesses just like George's, that Congress come together and pass legislation that'll help American families and American workers. Yeah. I know as the president of the Senate, uh, I'm curious to know when you might go over and shake them up on Capitol Hill because they've been fighting like cats and they need to get something done. The American people are waiting. Well, Bill? Harris, I can tell you what's been encouraging so far is the first two bills that the president requested. There really has been strong bipartisan support. Now, issues have arisen over the last two days, but our team on Capitol Hill tells us that we're really getting down to the fine print. We're hoping for a vote in the Senate today. I spoke to a member of uh, House Democrat leadership last night and it said this is just a time what the president wants to see is for the Congress to come together as they did on those earlier two bills and provide support for workers, for businesses, for families in America. And we're going to continue to drive toward that. And we continue to remain hopeful that that'll okay. happen and it'll happen soon. We have many more questions teed up, so stand by here. We're in the, the Rose Garden at the White House and many more questions in a moment. 
Uh, the president will join our conversation as well. He'll answer them in our, our virtual town hall. It's never been done this way before, but this is a moment in our nation's history where we all get a little inventive, and we shall throughout the afternoon. Live back at the White House as our coverage continues on this special edition on the Fox News Channel. Join us in moments. We'll continue to take your questions. We'll get some answers for you as we all try and figure out what America's facing and really what the world's facing. I'm Bill Hemmer here in the Rose Garden at the White House. My colleague Harris Faulkner joins us as well. And uh, we'll get back to Harris momentarily here, but the vice president continues uh, to be with me here. Nice to see you again. I, Thank you, Bill. Uh, every morning when I wake up, I go to the Johns Hopkins Global Map, mm -hmm. and I'm studying data and numbers from various countries, not just ours, but South so Korea and China and Italy and Spain over the weekend, too. What is the first bit of data that you look for the moment you wake up in the morning? Well, it really is how we begin every meeting of the White House Coronavirus Task Force. Dr. Deborah Burks is probably the leading expert on infectious diseases in the world. And the day the president tapped me to lead this task force, uh, I picked up the phone and told her she needed to come to the White House. And she's been my right arm every step of the way. So um, would she be the person who brings you the first she does. piece of information yeah. on a daily basis? Yeah, what Dr. Burks said yesterday at the podium at the briefing is, is our entire approach. We, we, we want every decision 
that we bring to the president to make, to be informed by the data, informed by the experience, is from what we know of China. Mm -hmm. uh, and we've had, had, we did have people on the ground in February that looked at their raw data. But we've been carefully studying South Korea, carefully studying what's happening in Italy. We've been trying to apply those lessons learned here. For instance, in Italy at this point, at the average age uh, of death is 80, and it heavily skews to people that had serious underlying health conditions. What Dr. Burke said is that among the majority of those who died in Italy, they had at least three pre-existing conditions. She's, she's spoken that about fact? that. It's, it's what we see. The average age of contracting the disease in Italy is 60. And at this point, no one, no one under the age of 30, no one under the age of 30. Uh, has uh, has died from the disease. And of course, their death rate has been much higher than any other country. Yes. They're more than 9%. Ours has been relatively low, right around 1.3%, which is where South Korea was uh, or is at the moment, too. But can too. I just also uh, say that, you know, our hearts go out to every family that's lost a loved one to the coronavirus. And it's one of the reasons why the president, early on, uh, we, we, we changed all the guidelines for every nursing home in America. We raised the standards. We deployed all 8,000 of our nursing home inspectors across the country to enforce guidelines on the spread of infectious disease. Uh, and, and that's why we essentially said no visitors to nursing homes anymore, except in cases of hospice care. We don't want to deny families being That could be tough, together. too. You know, a lot of strain we, on, on many people We know people at this point it. who's the most vulnerable, yeah. Bill. Mm -hmm. And whatever decision the president makes about reopening America, as he said, in weeks, not months, we are going to continue to focus the attention and the compassion of the American people and our health care providers on people that are most vulnerable okay. in that senior with a serious underlying condition. That brings us to our next question uh, for the vice president on coronavirus. Here is what Brett wants to know about American U.S. testing. My question for you is how long do you think it'll be before all the United States could get testing for the coronavirus? Um, we're doing better, but is there an answer today? Uh, Brett, it's a great question, and what I can tell you is that literally testing is expanding all across the country by the tens of thousands every day. Uh, you might be encouraged to know that as of last Monday, we had tested roughly 50,000 people in this country who'd gotten the results. But because President Trump brought together the top commercial labs in America the better part of a month ago and brought them into this system, and ask them to harness the immense ability of our commercial labs to process testing. Literally, the report that I received yesterday was that in one short week, we'd done more than a quarter of a million tests around the country. And, and we will soon be at a place where not just testing is available in the areas where we've seen outbreaks, but testing is going to be broadly available all across the country. We're getting there. Uh, the FDA actually just approved a swab test that can be self-administered, and you can contact your doctor about, about how to, uh, how to uh, use that test yourself. We're developing new methodologies, but uh, the most important thing to say is that while the testing is important, and we especially were telling every commercial lab, uh, every state governor, we want to prioritize tests for people that have been hospitalized. We've issued that guidance from HHS. The reality is every American can make a difference by putting into practice the 15 days to slow the spread. Um, and uh, for anyone who has a, a vulnerable senior in your home, uh, I love what uh, Dr. Fauci and Dr. Burke said not long ago, and that is to keep them safe, you should just conduct yourself, if you have someone in your home as a senior with a serious underlying health condition, just act like you have the coronavirus. Yeah, that is, so wash many. your hands a lot, social distancing, 
clean surfaces on a regular basis. That's how we protect our most So many vulnerable. tens of millions of us have changed our behavior in that short period of time, and it was jarring in the beginning. Uh, you've got your experts. We've got some good ones, too. Mm -hmm. So I introduce the next panel right now, a panel of doctors who have been with us from the beginning, and they've got pr uh, questions now for the vice president. Dr. Mehmet Oz, host of the Dr. Oz Show, and Dr. Mark Siegel, professor of medicine, NYU Lango Medical Center, also Fox News contributor. Dr. Nicole Sapphire, New York City physician, also a Fox News contributor. And as I say, hello. Hello to you all in various places. Dr. Oz, why don't you start with your question now for the Vice President? Mr. Vice President, the, the French physician who conducted the small pilot study showing that a malaria drug, it's called hydroxychloroquine, which is a, basically a malaria pill, and z which is azithromycin, stops the coronavirus infection, told me on my show that denying these medications, I'm going to quote him, is unethical. Now, the FDA appropriately desires randomized clinical trials for proof to guide the medical community. How can we accelerate these clinical trials while also satisfying the demand from physicians, frontline docs, who want these pills for their patients and themselves? Countries like China and France are already using them more widely. And, sir, a very personal question. Would you take these pills if you fell ill today? Well, first, Dr. Oz, let me thank you for, uh, uh, for your... Uh uh, encouraging words to the American people throughout the coronavirus. And frankly, that would go to every one of the doctors on, on this panel on Fox. We're grateful uh, to each of you. Uh, the good news is, is uh, the, uh, the, uh, the chloroquine medication we actually deployed in the state of New York, uh, uh, resources to be able to be administered to people. But I'm, I'm pleased to report to you, doctor, that uh, the FDA uh, is approving off-label use for, uh, for the hydrochloroquine right now. Doctors can prescribe that medication, which, as you know, is a, a perfectly uh, legal and approved malaria medication. But doctors can now, uh, can now prescribe uh, chloroquine for that off-label purpose of, of dealing with the symptoms of, uh, of coronavirus. We're, we're making that clear across the country. As you know, and I'm sure the president will say this when he joins us in a bit, the president's very optimistic, he's very hopeful that some of these anecdotal results that we've seen around the country will prove out to be true. But uh, I want to assure you, there's no barrier to access to chloroquine in this country. We're working to add to that supply even as we speak. We're working with uh, uh, companies like Bayer that, that produce vast amount uh, of chloroquine, but at the same time, to your point, we are engaging in a clinical trial while we make this broadly available for off-label use because we, we do want to take the opportunity, and we're doing that in New York State, uh, to study the, the results of this so that we can, we can better understand the impact going forward. Have you been able to answer his question about whether or not you would take it if you felt you needed it, Mr. I, Roger, I would follow the advice of my a physician, um, and uh, and I would recommend that approach to every okay. single American. Uh, Harris has a follow-up right, now. I, Harris, go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Bill. I, I just a couple of things for the vice president and Mr. Uh, or Dr. Oz. Dr. Oz, I want to start with you. The hydroxychloroquine. I'm curious. Do we know where that's manufactured? Because China is slow to get back online. So many of our pharmaceuticals are made there. So, can you just heard the vice president saying they're going to have more of it? Do we have a stockpile? What can you tell me? Well, I know from the task force that there is some drug that's available and that's coming online relatively rapidly. But you need about 20 pills for a therapeutic dose to take it over the 7 to 10 day period. So I don't think we have enough for all Americans. But I do believe, just for folks watching, that it could make a meaningful difference in how contagious the virus is and also how sick you get with it. We don't know that for sure because, as the vice president said, we haven't had the clinical trials. But I'd love to hear what the vice president has heard from the task force on the topic of, of availability of enough supplies if we use it not just to treat COVID-19 patients, but also prophylaxis for people who are near those patients, mm. uh, for example, spouses, and also doctors and nurses on the front lines who sometimes can't protect themselves in emergencies. Well, it, it's Mr. a Mr. great question. I, yeah, I spoke to Dr. Steve Hahn at FDA just yesterday about the availability of, of uh, chloroquine in the American marketplace, and, uh, and he said, uh, that there is a significant amount of chloroquine available for 
uh, prescription by doctors. The important thing was that uh, we had the FDA approve off-label use. It's a, it's a malaria medication. Doctors can prescribe it, but now doctors can prescribe it for dealing with the symptoms of coronavirus. But to Dr. Oz's point, we've also been working uh, with manufacturers overseas. I've personally spoken, as the president has, to the CEO of Bayer that produces uh, chloroquine. Uh, they've been working with us to bring back literally millions of doses from overseas manufacturing mm -hmm. facilities. That is happening as we speak. We'll focus those on, on, on areas where we have outbreak, where we have people that are struggling with coronavirus now. Uh, but uh, but to, uh, to uh, Dr. Oz's point, we're, we're also going to work to continue to spin up manufacturing so that it, on an increasing basis it's available okay. uh, for any American whose doctor might think that it would be helpful. Some of it's being tested in New York City. As that's of, where, we're, Bill, that's where we're doing the clinical yeah. test. It began this morning. We distributed right. thousands of doses across New York. And uh, it is a, it is a, the priority the president has placed on, on our response has been to those communities, Washington State, California, and New, New York, York uh, that have seen significant outbreak, but, but whether it be testing, whether it be supplies, uh, we're going to work to continue to make uh, 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 testing supplies and medicines more broadly available for every American. Dr. Mark Siegel joins our conversation now with a question. Dr. Siegel. Mr. Vice President, uh, our health care workers are hurting and they're fearful and they're worried and they're on the front line and they're heroes. I want to talk to you about vaccines. Dr. Fauci has told me he's got a lot of confidence in some of these vaccine candidates. Moderna, as you know, has one that's going into clinical trials. Germany has one. Baylor has one. Novo has one. Mm -hmm. uh, there are several of them that are possibilities. He feels confident that in a year or more we're going to get something that will work. Right. My question to you is, can you see a scenario where we would offer it way earlier than that to our health care workers who are, at, who are at great risk? Well, it's, uh, it's a great question. And, and what I would tell you is this is another example of how President Trump brought together the private sector, Mark. Um, it would be weeks ago the president brought in all the pharmaceutical companies, uh, not just the largest in this country, but the largest in the world. And, and he said, I want you to go straight to work. I want you to go to work on vaccines. I want you to go to work on what's called therapeutics, which are medicines that will bring relief. And, and thanks to the incredible efforts of these pharmaceutical companies and the FDA, as you know, we got to clinical trials in, in 62 days. That was a new American record. But that's just phase one of the trial. Uh, Dr. Fauci's told me again and again that to make sure these medications are safe, that, that the vaccine itself could be as much as a year and a half away. Uh, we'll, we'll follow the science on that. But the good news is that the therapeutics, we expect a little bit later this spring to have some breakthrough therapeutics that will be available, that will bring relief to Americans that are struggling with the coronavirus. Uh, and, and also, in the bill the Senate is considering right now, there's a provision that's been championed by Senator Steve Daines, a great senator, uh, and, and championed by others like Dr. Scott Gottlieb, that will actually create resources to allow the manufacture of different therapies and different approaches so that we're ready with the supply once we determine which one is most effective. It's another reason why we need to get that bill in the Senate passed, uh, not just mm -hmm. for American workers, American businesses, small and large, uh, but also because it's going to continue to fuel that innovation in the development of therapies and vaccines. Thank you, Dr. Siegel. Dr. Nicole Sapphire now with your question. Doctor, go ahead. Hi, thank you so much, Vice President Pence, for taking our questions and the transparency. Sure. It's very important to the American people. You know, I have a quick comment regarding Dr. Oz's question. You know, it does seem right now that Drs. Fauci and Burks, who I agree are incredible in this process, and I'm so glad they're involved, they seem to be taking a much more traditional approach to some of these experimental medications, as per se we saw in the past with HIV. Although we're encouraging fast track and compassionate use, you know, I wonder why we're not using parallel track, because right now our hospital systems are being 
overrun. And if we are able to get some of these medications for not only prophylaxis, but treating the severity of the symptoms, we wouldn't necessarily need as many respirators. Um, but that is just, you know, food for thought. Uh, my actual question for you, though, is, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and it's from healthcare workers all over right now, especially those small ones, you know, to handle the increased volume right now, we're shifting resources from the elective to emergent care, which is obviously leading to a large shift in healthcare dollars. Is there a plan to help the small medical practices and those servicing rural and underserved areas who routinely provide necessary elective care to maintain <clears throat> smaller practices despite, despite this massive shift in resources? Well, it's really a terrific question, uh, Doctor. And in the Senate bill that's being debated now, there's the last time I checked, there's about $100 billion for hospitals uh, that would recognize that we're asking Americans, we're asking hospitals to, to, uh, to postpone elective surgery. And, and frankly, millions of Americans are. That's freeing up a tremendous amount of supplies, masks, especially, uh, especially those critical ventilators. And, uh, and, and, uh, but the impact on the hospitals is very real. That's why it's in the Senate bill. L let me speak, though. I, I want to be very clear. What I hear from Dr. Fauci and Dr. Bergs is actually that we are on a dual track, um, whether, whether it be the hydrochloroquine or some other uh, hopeful medications. We're working with the FDA to allow these already legal medications to be used for off-label prescriptions by doctors, that they can be used for coronavirus. But we're also, at the same time, we're, we're going to do a clinical test so that we can be straight with the American people about what we know is happening. But I, I want all the viewers to understand that it, it's a dual track. This is a president that uh, it, it is all of the above. He wants, he wants all the resources to be brought to bear, federal, state, local. And one last word, if I, if I might, Bill, that our health care workers have just done an incredible job. Amazing. Uh, in, in Washington State, New York City, California, all across the country, men and women that are, that are coming in, uh, that, are, that are providing compassionate uh, uh, care to people that are struggling with the symptoms. I mean, it, it, and, and doing so oftentimes uh, oftentimes uh, uh, with long hours and great difficulties. And I just want, I want our healthcare workers to know that other than the patients who have contracted this disease, especially the most vulnerable, at the same level of priority this president has placed our health care workers. It's one of the reasons in the last bill we insisted that they change the law so that industrial masks, the N95 masks, could now be sold to hospitals. It's freed up tens of millions of masks that are now being distributed all across the country, sold to hospital systems, states being distributed uh, through FEMA. And, and lastly, and doctor, you mentioned the ventilators. Uh, I, I just received word, I know we started our conversation this hour on the subject of ventilators and the challenges that the state of New York faces. And, and I was so pleased to confirm that uh, earlier today, uh, FEMA from the national stockpile shipped 2,000 ventilators to the state of New York. And tomorrow there will be another 2,000 ventilators shipped from the national stockpile. We have a ways to go yet. It's the reason why we're, we're marshalling all the resources, not just from the national stockpile, but from our existing supply and hospitals and that equipment that can be converted. And a lot of but I want to let the, Amer the people in New York know that uh, earlier today, 2,000 2, ventilators were shipped directly to New York. New York is truly the epicenter of the coronavirus the now in our country. 2,000 more will be arriving tomorrow. And when you talk about protective gear and just uh, we, we started this hour in ventilators and you're concluding this hour literally uh, with some breaking news for New York and that will be some relief but we've got a ways to go. On the protective gear, even yesterday the governor of Michigan was saying we've got enough to get us through the next shift. We don't have enough to get us through the next day. Just can you address her concerns, Gretchen Whitmer, as she voiced that yesterday? Well, what I can say is that we are, we are spinning up American industry um, whether it be companies like 3M or Honeywell that make this, these protective masks, they're called N95 masks. Yes. Um, but what the president did 
in asking Congress in a bipartisan way to change the law to extend liability protection has now made it possible for tens of millions of masks that are used on construction Can sites you meet the need? to be used at hospitals. I believe that the combination of more production that's happening from companies around the country, from our national stockpile, but also the need is also being met. I mean, it's extraordinary, Bill. I mean, companies like Apple just announced that they're donating six million of these industrial masks Let's keep it to coming. FEMA yeah. and three million to our states. It's inspiring the way businesses are donating these supplies to our hospitals. I'm grateful for your time. And we need them to keep it coming. And we're about to bring in the president. President Trump is heading over now. He'll answer your questions as well uh, for the next hour. Our virtual town hall continues with the vice president and now President Trump next. We are.
Burks and the Surgeon General, Dr. Jerome Adams. And welcome and thank you all for being here. Thank you. Unusual circumstances where we're, you're trying to communicate with the American people. We're trying to maybe bring the American people a little closer to you and get some answers. Well, that's true. To, to you, Mr. President, when was the moment that you thought, we got to move on this? Well, I think when I started seeing and reading about China and seeing what was going on in China, Wuhan and specifically, it seemed to come mostly out of there, that area, uh, the province. And when I saw that and I saw the kind of death they were, you know, talking about on television, uh, on in the papers, and I, I started reading a lot about it. And really, when I had to make a decision, do I stop people from China and specifically that area, but from China to come into the country? and Everybody was against it. Almost everybody, I would say, was just absolutely against it. We've never done it before. We never made a decision like did, that. Did before. somebody come to you with a bit of information, a piece of data? Uh, was it a world leader? Was it a no, member of no. your own it team? Was what was it? No, we had a, a large group of people right behind me in the Oval Office, and I made it. I consulted with Mike, but we made a decision. I made a decision to uh, close off to China. That was weeks early. And honestly, I took a lot of heat. Uh, Sleepy Joe Biden said, uh, it's xenophobic. I don't know if he knows what that means, but that's okay. Uh, he said, it's uh, racist, what I did. Uh, thousands and thousands of more people, probably tens of thousands, would be dead right now if I didn't make that decision. And I must say, doctors, uh, nobody wanted to make that decision at the time. It was very, very early. Uh, call it luck or call it talent, it doesn't matter. We made a great decision. I took a lot of heat from China. They weren't happy with it. Uh, now they understand it. And they've really, you know, we're doing just fine. But they were not happy with it. Br bring I took, it I took to, a lot of heat uh, from a lot of people. Bring the conversation to present day. In the past day and a half, you got a lot of attention for this. A tweet that I think went out late at night. You said, the cure, we cannot let the cure be worse than the problem itself. I really and didn't get, So you start to look yeah. at this 15-day period, which sure. will come to us day 15 is next Monday today, yeah. arguably day nine. Yeah. What are you trying to gauge as to how you can open the country back up again? Yeah. When you say I took a lot of heat for that, essentially, I really didn't. I mean, a lot of people agree with me. Our country is not supposed to be, you know, it's not, it's not built to shut down. Our people are full of vim and vigor and energy. They don't want to be locked into a, a house or an apartment or some space. They, it's not for our country. It, we're, not, we're not built that way. And I said, you know, I don't want the cure to be worse than the problem itself, the problem being obviously the problem. And, you know, you can destroy a country this way by closing it down, where it literally goes from being the most prosperous. I mean, we, we had the best economy in the history of our country three weeks ago. And then all of a sudden, we're supposed to shut it down. And then we're supposed to pay people not to go to work. We never had that. We used to pay people to go to work when right. we had... But this is a government a order to go ahead and stay home. It's tricky, though, when you try and turn the faucet back on. It, oh, it's it, very tricky. New York could be different from... It is. It uh, is. Utah, Louisiana is. could be different from sure. Arizona. So how do you go about making that decision? Here? Well, you have to make the decision. Look, we lose thousands. I brought some numbers here. We lose thousands and thousands of people a year to the flu. We don't turn the country off, I mean, every year. Now, when I heard the number, you know, we average 37,000 people a year. Can you believe that? And actually, this year, we're having a bad flu season. But we lose thousands of people a year to the flu. We never turn the country off. We lose much more than that to automobile accidents. We didn't call up the automobile company and say, stop making cars. We don't want any cars anymore. We have to get back to work. Now, with all of that being said, it's incredible what the American people have done. And, and honestly, the American people have learned. We've all learned together between the shaking of the hands and the washing of the hands. Well, I used to wash my hands, and I always wash my hands a lot. I never was a big believer in shaking hands. Once I become a politician, you shake hands, and you get a little bit used to it. Like, immediately when I see you, I, I sort of apologize that I'm not shaking well, your hands. Well, we exchange you air elbows, yeah, which is, seems well, to be the like thing to, to say. I never like to see that, actually. But, yeah, but right now on Capitol Hill, you, you've got members of the Senate debating a $2 trillion bill. Yeah, more than I that. Mean, did you think that... Uh, it, it, it blows away the ability for us to imagine that they could pass legislation 
in excess of $2 trillion. Right. Now, who knows what's behind the curtain there? Who knows what is stacked into $2 trillion? How much You're concern right. do you have well, we that the deal you could be thing. facing criticism that President Obama faced in, in 2009 well, we canceled. about sweetheart deals for certain companies, sure. as Democrats would argue? I canceled the deal last night. I said, I'm not going to sign that deal because Nancy Pelosi came in and put a lot of things in the deal that had nothing to do with the workers, that had to do with an agenda that they've been trying to get passed for 10 years. And I came in, I told Mike, I told... A lot of people, there's no way I'm signing that deal. I was getting calls from John Kennedy, from Ben Sass, from uh, many, many people, Lindsay. I, I was getting calls from a lot of different people saying, this deal, uh, Tom Cotton, this deal is terrible, what they've done. They took a deal. You know, we almost had a deal the day before. And it was between Schumer and uh, Mitch, and it was really a good, solid deal. All of a sudden, they start throwing all of the little uh, Green New Deal stuff in, right? And uh, the boardrooms, what they look like, and uh, we want uh, green energy, we want all this stuff. Let's stop drilling oil. They had things in there that were terrible, windmills all over the place, and all sorts of credits for windmills to kill the birds and ruin the real estate, right? Uh, a lot of problems. I mean, a lot of problems. And I said, I'm not signing this With deal. $2 trillion. Now they've renegotiated. It's hard to avoid some of oh, those oh, trap doors, you could yeah, argue. But we have great things for not only companies. Forget the companies. The companies are nothing other than they are an employer of thousands and thousands of people. And they pay them very well. We want to protect our workers. I want to protect our workers. Workers first. Mm -hmm. But you have to protect companies like Boeing. They had a real bad year, let's face it, with the problems. And they were in trouble before this. And then all of a sudden this happened. We can't lose a Boeing. And we can't lose some of these companies. And companies, frankly, Bill, that were solid as like AAA companies, because of what's happened over the last couple of weeks, they go from AAA to being like they could use a hand. Tough time. We can't, right, yeah. we can't lose those companies. If we lose those companies, we're talking about hundreds of thousands of jobs, millions yeah. of jobs. The faster we go back, the better it's going to be. We have a pent-up energy that's going to be unbelievable. We're going to bring it back fast. I really believe that. I've got a lot more questions, sure. and uh, my, so does my colleague Harris Faulkner. I'll oh. allow her to rejoin She's the conversation great. now. Harris. Do I have an earplug here? Um, a... I'll, I'll help you out. If yeah. I could Hello. do that. Go ahead, Harris. I'll, Hello, Mr. I'll relay President. and translate. Okay. Hello, Mr. President. So good to see you today. Uh, this will be a little bit to relay. I, I understand you guys are going back and forth on the economy and employers. But more than 66% of people are employed by small businesses. The VP talked a little bit about this. We hear you dropping big companies' names. The question here is, how do you shore up both as you look forward? Yeah. Um, the question's a good one, uh, and it's pointed. You're talking about Boeing, and yet you've got, what, two-thirds of American businesses are small businesses. Right. And you think about um, what they're trying to do in terms of adjusting to this new reality that's been thrown on them. What will you do for small business? Okay, well, first of all, I have to say that Harris is one of my favorite people. And I didn't hear a word she said, and I was hoping it wasn't too devastating a question. But she is a fantastic person, I have to say that, okay? Now that I've said it, because I can't hear Harris, but uh, no, the bill is very much focused on the small business person. It it's very much focused on small companies, including restaurants and all sorts of small companies. And what people don't realize, you know, you talk about these massive, we have the greatest companies in the world. You talk, you add them all up, and the small businesses are just about equal in size to these massive companies, of which we have many also. It's, it's the engine of our country, small business. This bill is absolutely aimed at the small business and the worker and the workers of those small businesses and the owners. The owners are going to need help. They're going to need some loans. They're going to need things. And we're going to be able to take care of them because we don't want those small businesses to go out of business, mm. nor do we want the big businesses to go out of business. When they said, Mr. President, we got to shut this down, how hard did you push back? Well, I'll tell you, I never heard of a, such a thing. We've had flus where we lose 36,000. We've lost as many, I guess, as 78,000 people in one year. And they came in and they said to me, sir, we're going to have to close the country. I said, what are you talking about? Well, we have a virus. It's coming in. And I knew that. And I made the early decision with China. So I already, already closed it off to China. And that was a long time before they came in. But they came in, experts, 
And they said, we're going to have to close the country. I said, we've never closed the country before. This never happened before. You're going to, you're saying, I said, are you, are you serious about this? We are going to take this country that's fully employed, where we have 160 million people working, and you're telling me we have to close it? And people are going to go out of business, and they're going to go bankrupt, and they're not going to have jobs? What are we talking about here? Just don't forget, this has never been done. We've had flus before. We've had viruses before. So this is something new. And this is why I say we have to, I gave it two weeks, and, and you know, I guess by Monday or Tuesday, it's about two weeks, and we'll assess at that time, and we'll give it some more time if we need a little more time. But we have to open this country well, up. When they came to you and had that conversation with you, how long did it take you to accept that new reality? Well, I, look, I accept things. I understand things very quickly. I mean, I, I understood exactly what they were saying. Uh, but we can socially distance ourselves and go to work, and you'll have to work a little bit harder. You can clean your hands five times more than you used to. You don't have to shake hands anymore with people. That might be something good coming out of this. Although I must tell you, as a politician, it's a lot warmer when you walk into a crowd and you're shaking a lot of people's hands. You love those I'd, people. I'd agree with you. They love that. me and I yeah. love them, you know, but, but it is a little bit uh, colder. But, but you won't be shaking hands for at least a while, and, and things will happen. But we have to put the country to work. Look, you're going to lose a number of people to the flu, but you're going to lose more people by putting a country into a massive recession or depression. You're going to lose people. You're going to have suicides by the thousands. You're going to have all sorts of things happen. You're going to have instability. You can't just come in and say, let's close up the United States of America, the biggest, the most successful country in the world by far. You know, when I came in, when I was elected, and you knew this number, China was going to overtake us in the year 2019. It wasn't even close. We went way up, and they didn't. We've done great. They pay us a fortune in tariffs and everything else, and yet we have a good relationship with them. We just signed a trade deal. But we're the number one in the world by far. And now a few people walk into the Oval Office and say, sir, we have to close up the country. And I, that said, what you, I said, what are you talking about? And that, about? Mr. President, must have been a very difficult thing to accept. One of the most difficult decisions I've ever made because I knew that when you do it, as soon as you do it, you're going to drop, I mean, they're talking about 20 or 25 points of GDP. Nobody's ever heard of 25 points. If we went down a point, that's a big deal. Now, all of a sudden, you're basically turning off the country. I said, this has never been done before. What are you talking about? But we understand it. You have hot spots. But we've had hot spots before. We've had horrible flus. I mean, think of it. We average 36 1,000 people, death, death. I'm not talking about cases. I'm talking about death. 36,000 deaths a year. People die, 36, from the flu. But we've never closed down the country for the flu. So you say to yourself, what is this all about? Now, how did you... It's never been done. How did you process that? Uh, not good. I wasn't happy about it. And I also knew that... I had to do it because, look, uh, with Turkey, I give this as an example, and Syria. I said, sign a deal with the Kurds, make peace. Erdogan, he didn't want to. He's a, he's a man who loves Turkey, and I have a very good relation. I said, sign a deal. He didn't really want to. The Kurds didn't really want to. And it went on, you know, the so-called safe zone the free, recently, yeah. a few months ago. I said, sign a deal. Do me a favor, sign a deal, get it done. They didn't really want to. All of a sudden, they start fighting, 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 fighting. And it was vicious, and other countries got involved. Now I say, let's sign a deal. They said, okay, we'll sign a deal. We needed a period, because I don't think, if, if I would have not done it, we would have been unbelievably criticized for not doing it. But it's never been done before. One more. So, uh, Bill, yep. somehow, the word got out that this is the thing we're supposed to be doing. Now, we've had some really bad epidemics and other things. I mean, we're going this pandemic, but we've had bad epidemics. I'm sure they could have been called pandemics. But we never did a thing like this before. But I had to do it. It's been very painful for our country. 
and very destabilizing for our country. And we have to go back to work much sooner than people thought. And people can go back to work and they can also practice good judgment. One last question, then we'll get back to our viewers here, too. A month ago, the CDC had an initial test that failed. At that moment, late February, you said it's perfect. And it, and it wasn't perfect. So what happened there in the early stages well, what I said in was, late February? What I said is perfect was my conversation with the head of the Ukraine. That's what I really said is perfect. OK, that was another whole scandal, nonsense, a total, you know, witch hunt. But this one is a much different thing. We had other administrations, not just the last one. They built up a platform. They built up a test. But the test was no good. It didn't handle large numbers of people. It was okay for a very small group, but not for a large group. So, so we so had to then, break it down. Did, did the CDC screw up, or did you screw no, up? No, we did not well, screw where up. Where did this and go wrong? And I don't wrong. think CDC screwed up either. They had a test that would have worked for a small group of people. In other words, for a normal problem. I don't think anybody could have, in all fairness to CDC, and this is a big government agency, and they're very good people in there. But nobody ever expected a thing like this. Nobody would say that millions and millions of people would have been tested. So what we did is we broke that egg. We broke that system. And we've created a new system that now we're doing unbelievably big numbers. And it's set for the future, should we ever need it again. I hope we don't need it again. Thank you for your time. We're going to bring the others in as Good. well in a moment. Thank you for being patient. We will get to you. We have so many questions, not only from our network, but from millions of people all across the country. So your questions in a moment here as we continue live in the Rose Garden at the White House with the president and his task force in Washington.
Welcome back to our Fox News virtual town hall with President Trump and his coronavirus task force. Uh, excited to finally get to be able to talk one on one with him now. We got our tech problems worked out. I want to first ask you, Mr. President, about the idea of the political division that's going on on Capitol Hill. You're talking about these bills, this phase one, two, and three of the stimulus bill, like they're going to fix so much with the economy, and people yeah. are literally fighting like cats. I mean, what can you do to bring them together? Well, I think they're actually coming together. We had a bill that was done the other night, and then all of a sudden somebody else injected herself in, and all of, uh, we, didn't have a, we didn't have anything that was even remotely signable. But now I, I hear just uh, from a few minutes ago that they're doing well, and it's for the workers, it's oh. for the people of the country, and I hear they're doing pretty well, so we'll see how it comes out. But it should have been, well, it's like uh, I watched uh, uh, Governor Cuomo, and he was very nice. We're building them hospitals, we're building them medical centers, and he was complaining about we're doing probably more, definitely more fa than anybody else. And uh, he mm -hmm. was talking about the ventilators, but he should have ordered the ventilators. And he had a choice, he had a chance, because right here, I just got this out, that he refused to order 15,000 ventilators. I, I'll show this to Bill, but take a look at that, Bill. What does that say? Is this social distancing here? This <laughs> says that New York Governor Cuomo rejected buying recommended 16,000 ventilators in 2015 for the pandemic, for a pandemic, established death panels and lotteries instead. So he had a chance to buy in 2015 16,000 ventilators at a very low price, and he turned it down. I'm not blaming him or anything else, but he shouldn't be talking about us. He's supposed to be buying his own ventilators. We're going to help. I but, you know, if you, I, think about, I, if you think about Governor Cuomo, we're building him four hospitals, we're building him four medical centers, we're working uh, very, very hard for the people of New York, we're working along with him, and then I watch him on the show complaining, and he had 16,000 ventilators that he could have had at a great price and he didn't buy them. Yeah, and I hear you going back and forth, and, and Governor Cuomo has talked in recent days that you regularly talk and have a good relationship uh, and so we will follow the news as you're bringing it to us there, right there in the Rose Garden. I want to get to a viewer because the people's voice is so huge right now and always, Mr. President. Joyce submitted a question from Facebook okay. about the stimulus checks. Let's watch and I want to get your reaction. I am fortunate. I can continue to work. I can telecommute. There are people who are losing jobs. They're losing an entire income for a household. And um, rather than receive a check, I would just like to pay it forward and have the government pass mine on to someone else. Wow, is that great. Well, Mr. you President. obviously come from West Virginia. I love that state. <laughs> and thank you very much, Joyce. I'll tell you what, that's great. I wish we had more people like Joyce, I'll tell you. But, um, you know, it's going to be a substantial amount of money, around $3,000 for a family of four. And assuming it all gets done, assuming we can get the Democrats to sign it, but uh, it'll be great. But, Joyce, I think that's such a nice gesture. Really, I appreciate it. Thank you. Well, and you just said, right when you and I began talking a few minutes ago, that, you know, almost in breaking news fashion, it looks like the, the juggernaut might be moving on Capitol Hill to, to try to push toward that stimulus bill. So we'll yeah. be watching for that. Uh, you know, Mr. President, I'm watching the Dow as you have been talking and, and formerly uh, the vice president. It's up by more than 1,500 points. What do you watch for each day? I mean, are you keeping your eye on that? Is it, is it companies calling you, small and large? Like, what, what is your barometer that, okay, yeah. things are in trouble or things are doing better? Well, I think the Dow was helped by the fact that they, you know, they were... Uh, theories that we we're going to stay out for four or five months, and you can't do that. As a country, you'd destroy our country if you did a thing like that. And uh, we're going to be opening uh, relatively soon. We our our time comes up on Monday or Tuesday, or you know the allotted two weeks. But we'll stay a little bit longer than that. But we want to get open very soon. I think that was a big reason it's gone up. I also think that the fact that the Senate and the House, I, we, we seem to be getting along. As much as you can get along, we seem to be getting along now on a, on a bill. I, I think that maybe had even less of an impact than the fact that we're opening up this incredible country, because we have to do that. I'd love to have it open by Easter. Okay? I would oh, love wow. to have it open okay. by Easter. I will, I will tell you that right now. I would love to have that. It's such an important day for other reasons, but I'll make it an important day for this, too. I would love to have the country 
opened up and they're just raring to go by Easter. That's April 12th. Uh, so we will watch and see what happens. I'm going to toss it back to my cohort, yeah. Bill. Thank you, Harris. That would be a, a great American resurrection <laughs> two and a half plus weeks from <laughs> now. So, uh, Dr. Burks, a series of questions on the medical front here. I want to go to Allison from Indiana, appropriately so, Mr. Vice President, who has a question by way of Facebook about possible mutation. Watch. My question is this. If you were to get the coronavirus, can it mutate and can you get it again? Mm -hmm. Dr. Burks? So that's a great question um, and a very smart question because it's an RNA virus. It can mutate and it constantly mutates. But what has been pretty good about the coronaviruses in general is they keep their structural pieces very similar. What do I mean by that? There's certain the outer coat, the envelope, and the inside part of the virus has stayed very constant. It's even very similar to SARS, which we haven't seen since 2003. And so we, what has been picked for sites, both for the vaccine and for monoclonal antibodies, are very much those constant sites. And we believe that anybody who becomes positive and makes effective antibody, because there are some people who can't make as good of antibody as others, but if you make effective antibody, Body, you shouldn't get reinfected. The way it was described to me, and correct the <clears throat> medical positioning of this question, but the virus is trying to figure out a way to survive, and that's where it moves around and it mutates. Now, in Singapore, there was a headline earlier today suggesting a possible second wave in that island nation. How do you, how do you gauge that? Well, remember in Singapore, they took the president's guidelines and they executed them very early because they could see China next door. And so they saw those and they implemented those guidelines. So very few people became infected in Singapore. Because so few people have been infected, you don't have what they call herd immunity. And so until we get through this current pandemic, this if it has seasonality, which we hope and believe it could, if it gets through this current season, it will be in everybody's best interest to do as the president has recommended our work on vaccines, our work on additional therapeutics, and really getting to both pre and post prophylaxis so that the healthcare providers can get get a shot potentially that will protect them. We would call it pre-exposure prophylaxis. All of those things are being worked on to prepare us for the next season. We're, so we're focused today on what we need today and to go to get through this current epidemic. And then we're also getting prepared in case it comes back in the fall or in case it comes back in the fall of 2021 when we'd have a vaccine. I'm going to bring the Surgeon General on this and to both of you. I've been listening to you very carefully for weeks now. And what you've said is we want to be the model of South Korea. Well, South Korea has flattened the curve, to borrow a phrase, and their death rate is about 1.2%. Uh, this morning here in the U.S., our death rate was right around that same mark, 1.3 percent. Uh, to the Surgeon General, what, what does that tell you, or how much do you consider the death rate here at home when we try and make decisions for ourselves? Well, thank you for that, Bill. I think there are a couple of important things for the American people to remember. The first one is that when you look at the data here in the United States, of all the people who we've tested so far, only about 90 percent of those, well, 90% of those folks do not have the coronavirus. They test negative. So most people, even when they have cold and flu symptoms, do not have coronavirus, number one. Number two, 98, 99% of people are recovering. So people need to understand that, yes, some people will get coronavirus in many communities across America, but that most of them will recover. That, that's very important for people to, uh, to understand. And uh, beyond that, we're trying to help people understand the importance of stopping the spread. And the president, when, when, when he, nine days ago, listened to his health, his health providers, his health, his health consultants, he said, what do we need to do right now? And we said we need to lean into this next two weeks to stop the spread, and then we need to re reassess. And one thing I can tell you for certain is that I've been on the task force for three weeks, and the president listens to Tony Fauci. He listens to Dr. Burks. He listens when I, or Dr. Carson, or Dr. Hahn, 
or Dr. Redfield speak up. And he also listens to the governors. And so we will assess at the end of the 14 days and we'll figure out the most appropriate thing to do. And based on my experience in the task force so far, the president will make an appropriate decision based on all the data. Thank you for that answer. Is everything cool with you and Dr. Fauci? He was oh, not absolutely. there. He wasn't there last night for no. the briefing. He's not here today. Because he has other it's things to do. Force. No, we, we get along very well. Your relationship's good? I think it's been very good. You would have heard about it if it wasn't. Mm. I mean, it, every time he does, he's not at a meeting. And sometimes other people, too. They said, why isn't uh, Dr. Burks at a meeting? Is there a problem? And I said, Deborah, could you please come to the meeting? Do you mind? Because, no, they, they you know, I, I respect all of these people. These are great people. Uh, and Deborah is extraordinary. And Tony's extraordinary. I get along with all of them. But if there's, you know, they have other things to do. And yesterday we weren't really talking about what he's an expert on. We were talking about other things, a lot of other things. And, uh, you know, they, I don't think they should be at every so news conference. So you're good. That's the point. Yeah, we're fine. We're fine. Dr. Burks, early on, you said it, the, the massive amount of testing in South Korea, 96 percent to the Surgeon General's point, 96 percent came back negative. I think that's an important point uh, to convey again to the American people. Uh, Noah from Maryland has a question now. His question is about uh, health care workers on the front lines of this mm -hmm. pandemic. Now, my mother is a nurse. She works in the health care field. What do you and your team plan to do to help health care workers that are putting themselves at risk every single day as a result of the coronavirus? Excellent question. Dr. Burks, you want to? Okay. Yeah, that's I love that question because my mother's a nurse. Um, she's 91 now, so she's not practicing. But I think we have to remember in majority of hospitals and in majority of places, it is the nurse that are the front lines. They're the ones working every moment with the patients to ensure that they do well. They're the ones at the bedside. They're the ones providing comfort. They're the ones providing the medical interventions. And they are our first priority. It is why we've worked so hard to get the protective, um, personal protective equipment equipment out there. But I think what we didn't often talk about is we're really with the changing guidelines for testing. That is going to free up all of that personal and protective devices that were being utilized for testing back into the hospitals and the clinics for our nurses and doctors. And that's going to make millions of more mask and PPE, as we call it, available to the hospital workers who need it the most, because now people can self-test. Mm. And Bill, can I jump in on that really quickly? Uh, I want people to know that I'm a still practicing anesthesiologist at Walter Reed. The vice president and I, we first met during Ebola. And I went into the hospital. I put on PPE. I know how scary it is even when you have the proper equipment to deal with an infectious disease. And I'm getting texts, phone calls, messages from people all across the country. And I want healthcare workers of America to know we are fighting for you each and every day to make sure you get what you need from the stockpile, to make sure you get what you need from manufacturers across America, to make sure you're getting uh, decreased demand, which is why we put out our new guidelines on elective surgeries. Because it's not just about increasing the supply. We aren't going to supply our way out of this problem, as important as supply is. We need to also lower demand by decreasing unnecessary usage of PPE. And a game changer that just came out just this week was the new FDA self swabs. And the vice president and the president have talked about that. That will utilize less PPE. So we're working on making sure supply gets where it needs to. And FEMA's doing a great job of that, but can, lowering demand. How can someone watching this right now acquire a self-test? Well, right now, the FDA is making that more available. We've seen testing increase in, in real numbers. When you look at last week from Monday to Friday, the amount of testing increased tenfold. So we're seeing testing increase. The, the concern is that it's actually using up more PPE, which is why we want to prioritize testing for the people who are most in need, the healthcare care workers, the people who are vulnerable, and why we're pushing. The FDA has lowered barriers like none other to make sure we can get these new testing modalities available that use less PPE and do more tests. Thank you for that. Back to Harris now with another question, Harris. Uh, all right. Actually, you know what? I want to stay on this uh, home testing kit topic for just a second with Dr. Burks. You know, the home test, who's, is there a, a place where people check a box and say I'm positive or not? How are you going to keep up with people who test themselves? And you need that information, Dr. Burks, to know where the clusters are in the country. That's part of why you would do it. Great. So it's not a home test. It's a self-test. So what do I mean by that? I mean, 
the individual can drive up, receive the items, because again, we still want to just test people with fever and symptoms that really need to be tested. They can self swab mm -hmm. the front of their nose, put it in the container, then the person can collect it with gloves, gloves alone with the biohazard bag and get it in. I just want to speak to the Americans for just a second, though. We have to ensure that we still are testing, even though. Probably by today, we will have done more tests than South Korea did in eight weeks, in the last eight yeah. days. In the last eight mm -hmm, days, mm -hmm. we've done more testing than South Korea. But we did that because we transformed the testing process as the president spoke to. But we don't want people who are just worried to go get tested. If you don't have a persistent fever, if you don't have a cough, if you're not in the risk group, if you're not a nurse or doctor, we really want the testing and the drive-through testing and the testing that is provided in the cities to be very much still focused on the people who need it. Because there's only so much even those high throughput machines are doing. They're doing about 50, 60, 70,000 tests a day now. They could get potentially to 150,000 a day. But we want to make sure mm -hmm. we're testing in the areas that really have the problems. Uh, yeah, Bill, it's, it's all one right. of the and, things. And knowing the difference between the I home may. and Go right ahead. Yeah, uh, thanks, Harris. You know, the American people are asking all the time, and the president and I hear it uh, uh, all the time and see it. It's what, what can they do to make a difference? And in, in addition to the 15 days to slow the spread, uh, the American people can take Dr. Burke's advice. It's that old proverb that it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. And one of the ways that you can mm -hmm. help is by recognizing we want to focus testing on people that have symptoms. Although, according to the tests now, as the Surgeon General said, 90% of the people that have been tested for the coronavirus don't have it, okay? That, that, that number, we've tested more than 320,000 people, uh, and, and that's an encouraging number, I would expect. But for any American out there that just may be concerned but not be symptomatic, one of the ways you can make sure the testing's available for people that have symptoms, and just as importantly, for our health care workers that we want to make sure have all the protective equipment that they need, uh, you, can, you can recognize that if you don't have symptoms, don't do a test. Harris, one Thank thing I might add, that, Bill. Uh, Harris, one thing I might add uh, that to me is so important. Again, we took something that was broken and we made it the model. Mm -hmm. And I didn't even know, I just heard the number for the first time from Deborah that in a short period of time, we've done more testing than South Korea. Mm -hmm. Now, you're not going to read that in the newspapers because they don't like to write things like that. But uh, I'd love you to say that one more time because that that's a big number. We've done more than South Korea in a short period of time. We're doing more now than South Korea by a lot. What weeks. was that number? So uh, we're believing that there are probably around 2,000, 29,000. 290,000. 290,000. 290, almost 300,000. And now we're way over 300,000, but we re achieved that over the last seven to eight days. We have to do more. We understand they that. They did that but over we eight went weeks. Over we're about eight up, weeks. We're going up proportionally. We're going up very, very rapidly. Every what, day we're going what up. What was higher. our negative test rate? At the moment, it's, is I'm it 90 percent or is it higher? So I really am glad you asked because this gets into where is the virus now and where is it expanding, and so. Across the country, our test rates are still way under 10 percent, except for one place, New York City, Metro New York, New Jersey, close to New York City. Those rates are coming in in the 28 percent range. Right now, New York, the case attack rate, what we're talking about, the number of people who are getting infected, is four to five times any other place in the country. Why is that? Density of population? I think part of it is density. Part of it is the spread that may have happened on metal surfaces, like in the subway and people that were in the subway. Part of it may be a large number of people came back after Christmas from Asia that didn't get caught up in the closure. Do you blame the governor for that? And part of it could be the Europeans who have come back subsequently. And there's, a, I mean, obviously, it's a big area of world trade and, and global transit. So I think the virus probably was quietly expanding because until it gets into an older population, you don't really see it in the same way. Thank you for that. And we'll get to all of you again yeah. in a moment here. Going to get a quick break here. More of your questions from across America here at the White House in the Rose Garden after this.
Welcome back to our Fox News virtual town hall with President Trump and members of his task force. We are in the Rose Garden here at the White House, and it's a real honor to be sitting here with you all. Thank you. And I hope together we can kill the virus and give a lot of people hope about getting back to their regular lives. That's true. You said something 20 minutes ago that I'm sure a lot of people were pretty keen on. You, you said that we would, I'm paraphrasing now, you would like to be back to normal by Easter Sunday. Yes. That's 19 days from now. It's okay. Is that true? Is that possible? Or is I that think false? It's possible. Why isn't it? I mean, we've never closed the country before, and we've had some pretty bad flus, and we've had some pretty bad viruses, and I think it's absolutely possible. Now, people are going to have to practice all of the uh, social distancing and don't shake hands and wash your hands and all of the things that we're doing now, but we have to get our country back to work. Our country wants to be back at work. That was not a, a controversial thing I said the other day. Our country wants to go back to work. And, and again, the cure, it's, it's like this cure is, is worse than the problem. Again, people, many people, in my opinion, more people are going to die if we allow this to continue. We have to go back to work. Our people want to go back to work. But what you have said consistently is the first order of business is to kill the virus. So. So when you look at the data from around the world and across our country, how do you determine that 19 days from now it, it might be safe? Because there are millions of people watching this now it, it may who be. have their family fortune yeah. on the line. Well, they have their family fortune on the line the other way, too. They're going to lose their jobs, maybe never to get them back. They're going to lose their businesses, never to get them back. We want to start up as soon as we can because we're going to have a very quick comeback if we do that. If we delay this thing out, you're going to lose more people than you're losing with the with the situation as we know it. So I think it's very important for our country to go back. And I've had many, many people, you know, when you said it was a little bit controversial, and not to most people. Most people think I'm right about it. Now, whether we're locked in a room or whether we're in our office and practicing all of the things that we're supposed to be uh, practicing, staying away from each other, you know, et cetera, it's not shaking hands, washing your hands all the time. But our country has to get back to work. Yeah, otherwise, otherwise, it's going to be very hard to start it up again. We can't lose the advantage that we have. What we're trying to figure out in this whole scenario here is how deadly the virus is. And so far, it is highly contagious, but not very deadly. We can agree on that based on the data, correct? Yes. I yes. mean, I, yes. So, so when you take the answer of Easter Sunday, do you see that as realistic? Do you see that as possible? So my job, and I think what's really important, is a lot of what we've done is we've tackled this epidemic the way people said we should have tackled flu in 1918. And they compared St. Louis, who took this kind of approach, to Philadelphia. What we're trying to do now is use 21st century solutions and trying to get data down to the most granular level so we understand what's happening at the area of the spread. So even today, there are counties throughout the United States that don't have their first case. So our job is to make sure they never have their first case and ensure that our efforts are focused on where the virus is expanding. That can be done today because we have that level of granularity. So that's what the president has asked us to put together, to use these two weeks to get all the data from around the country and all the data from around the globe and really understand what's working. And it's really important that the Americans know, I know the vice president covered this very clearly in the first hour, but every American needs to continue the president's guidelines for these next, yes. these next six Absolutely. days or seven days. We have to have them following those guidelines. And I see the Surgeon really General shaking his head in agreement, you, too. Bill, excuse me, just one second. You can't compare this to 1918 where close to 100 million people died. That was a flu, which is a little different, but that was a flu where if you got it, you had a 50-50 chance, or very close, of dying. I think we're substantially under 1% because the people that get better are not reporting. So we only know people that go to doctors and go to hospitals, and we're taking that, and we're still a little bit above 1%. When you add all of the people, the millions of people that have it, that get better, we're substantially less than 1%. And when they came to my office, don't forget, they were saying 3%, 4%, 5%. There's a very big difference. No, we have to put our country back to work. Um, we have a few minutes left, and I want to bring in our panel of experts, too. Dr. Mehmet Oz is with us, Dr. Mark Siegel, and Dr. Nicole Sapphire. I want to give you guys a round of questions quickly here. And Dr. Oz, um, why don't we start with 
Dr. Siegel this time around. Go ahead, Mark. Mr. President, uh, with the deaths going over 600 today, I, I want to say that fear, the fear that's coming out of this disturbs me the most. And fear divides. You need unification and unified leadership to fight the fear. So I was right. really encouraged to see you reaching out to governors, Governor Cuomo, Governor Newsom, making, making liaisons that weren't there before. Do you think that that kind of movement, where you're the leader and other people work with you, will help us to isolate the virus in the epicenters where they are, to separate out those epicenters? to test the people in those centers and to thereby squash the virus. I do. I think, doctor, it's a very good thing. And uh, Governor Newsom and I have been getting along really great. We're sending the ship, the great hospital ship, as you know. And uh, we are doing very well with, I think, almost all of the governors. For the most part, it really has become something. It's, it's, we're dealing almost every day. We're speaking to each other, whether it's conference calls. Usually we'll have 50 governors on the call at the same time. Uh, no, I think we're doing very well. But, you know, it's a two-way street. They have to treat us well also. They can't say, oh, gee, we should get this, we should get that. We're doing a great job, like in New York, where we're building, as I said, four hospitals, four medical. We're literally building hospitals and medical centers. And then I hear that, uh, you know, there's a problem with ventilators. Well, we sent them ventilators, and they could have had 15 or 16,000. All they had to do is order them two years ago, but they decided not to do it. They can't blame us for that. Dr. Oz is up next. Go ahead, doctor. Uh, Pre President Trump, uh, a good surgeon knows after the surgery when his patient can be discharged. And these 15 days are like a big operation on America. Yeah. But a great surgeon knows when there's a complication after discharge. So if we can meet the goal of fixing America and getting it back on its feet by Easter, I'd love to know exactly uh, how you know that is safe from a medical perspective. What's going to indicate that we might have to pull back a tiny bit in case we have a relapse? Well, I think, doctor, a thing like that could happen, but I really believe that we can do much of what we're doing and we can do it from a work environment instead of a, an environment where everybody's locked up and everybody is saying, oh, the business is gone, the business is gone, and everybody's suffering depression. You know better than anybody about depression. I've watched where you talk about depression, and that causes death and it causes a lot of problems. And you know, these are people, they want to save their business. They don't want to be locked up in some room or some apartment or house. And in the meantime, their restaurants closed, their businesses closed. They want to be saving their business. And I, I believe very strongly you're going to lose far more people by going that way than you are if we kept this thing going. I could keep them out. I mean, I'm sure that we have doctors that would say, let's keep it closed for two years. OK, let's close it up for two years. No, we got to get it open. Our people want it open, and that's the way this country was built. Dr. Nicole Sapphire now. Doctor, go ahead with your question. Thank you. And President Trump, I do believe as a nation that we are beholden to you for your decisive swish, swift action in the beginning with the travel ban. I do think that we would have been in a much different, worse situation had that not happened. However, we still did have a lag in the testing, which of course did not have anything to do with you. But my question is for Dr. Burks and the task force. As we still see across the nation that some people are not able to get tests, I have colleagues that still can't test some of their patients. Is there a plan to fast track or even parallel track rapid ELISA serological tests? Testing, um, to try and get this out there so that we can mobilize more PPE and more hospital beds by doing more testing and being able to um, isolate those people quickly. Yeah, that's a very good question. So right now, the tests that we have are all based on the RNA of the virus. And so we're utilizing the platforms, and, and thank goodness we're utilizing the platforms that were developed really to work and, and support HIV-positive clients. So this is their, their machines that have been used to detect their viral load for the last um, more than a decade in the United States. Those machines right now are being utilized for this test in a high-throughput way. We've asked developers to work on a point-of-care finger print test that could be used for antibody and antigen, um, but the antibody test will only tell you if you have been infected. Even if we can get IgM, it will be part of the early and probably recovery phase. And then we're working with companies to work on getting RNA tests that are point of care. So these are really critical tests that people are working on right mm -hmm. now. But in the meantime, we're using what we have today to ensure that we can get more testing done. And I just want to say I want to thank the American people and physicians who have let us prioritize. Remember, we didn't have this platform until eight days ago. 
We've done all of these diagnoses for inpatients primarily so that they can get on the appropriate therapy and we prioritize our testing to hospital patients. We will over the next few weeks be able to make more tests available to the actual American public with symptoms and to the doctor's offices as you've requested. And Nicole, it's important to remember we've done more tests in eight days than South Korea has done in eight weeks. And our tests are better, they're highly sophisticated. And frankly, I took one. It's not the most pleasant thing in the world, I will tell you that. We're gonna have a much simpler test very soon. But we have a really good test, and we've done more in eight days. Nobody knows that. I just heard this number a few minutes ago. I learned it from being on your show, actually. I think the way you Pretty described impressive. it was up the nasal passage and, yes. and took and a right hand. Hang a right. Hang a right at the hang, eye. Hang a right under uh, the to eye. To all of you, stand by. We've got a few more moments left here. But uh, as our virtual town hall continues, to all the doctors, Nicole Sapphire, Mehmet Oz, and Mark Siegel, uh, we very much rely on you on a day to day basis. So thank you for being a part of this today. Quick commercial break. Back to the Rose Garden in a moment as our town hall continues. If I built a van,
the White House. I'm Bill Hemmerlong with my colleague Harris Faulkner. I have about 90 seconds left. And just with the panel here, the president, the vice president, Dr. Birx, and the Surgeon General, thank you again for your Thank time. You I see this as a public service, but also as a way to try and figure out what the facts are, and that's that's the reason we came here. But you were just saying again, Mr. Vice President, during the commercial, the way you can achieve your objective is how? Well, the president made it clear yesterday that we we want to open up the country as soon as we can. But the key is that more Americans, and, and tens of millions are, Bill, but more Americans have put into practice the president's coronavirus guidelines, 15 days. Just read days those off spread, because it's hard to see. The sooner we'll be able to open up. Uh, what is it? Are, wash your hands if you're well, sick, it's, stay it's home. It's personal hygiene. It's it's if you if you're sick, stay home. If someone in your house has the virus, stay home. But it's also avoiding groups of more than 10, avoiding unnecessary travel. Uh, don't eat in restaurants during this period of time. Use the drive-through. These are all the principles that every American can do. Now, there are going to be Americans that, that have different guidance from their state and local officials that are more stringent. We defer to that. We respect that. But the more Americans that do this, the sooner that we'll be able, as the president said, to get back to work. We have to be a patient nation if you're going to ask them to do that, as you well know. Mr. President, thank you for thank your you time. You. And uh, I'll see you a bit later on Bill Hemmer Reports at 3 o'clock Eastern Time. And to Mr. Vice President Mike Pence, thank you. Dr. Birx, terrific work. And the Surgeon General, thank you for sharing your knowledge with us today. Uh, that is it from here at the White House. And um, Harris, I will see you.